So next we're gonna talk about how learning works across different brain areas. So we just focused on the learning in the neocortex and understanding how that might be doing some kind of error back propagation. Uh, next, we'll think about how basal ganglia and cerebellum cover these two most essential forms of learning, one from reward in basal ganglia and another from error in the cerebellum. And we talked about these earlier in the neuroscience chapter, the idea being that the basal ganglia is really important for um, figuring out what is going to lead to a good outcome versus a bad outcome and making that decision, that decision-making uh, property of the basal ganglia versus the cerebellum being really important for uh, ensuring smooth, efficient, effective motor actions and learning from those errors. So those are kind of the two most important forms of learning, and they're covered by these really basic brain systems that have been around, evolutionarily speaking, for a very long time. And then relative to that, we have the hippocampus that's, you know, kind of more evenly distributed in terms of how it learns, but it really has this kind of automatic self-organizing or kind of automatic characteristic where it's always learning. And then the neocortex, as we saw, kind of really learns a lot from error, but also we think is influenced by dopamine, as we'll see is the kind of key element in the basal ganglia reward learning, and then also exhibits some of this kind of more automatic self-organizing learning. So it's, it's also kind of a blend of these different types of learning. The overall story about learning is that it happens in the synapses in the particular brain areas in, in question. And so understanding, you know, the effect of learning in these different brain areas is essentially the same thing as understanding what are those brain areas doing in the first place. So learning in the basal ganglia is going to influence decision making. Uh, it's driven by this dopamine signal, as we'll see. Learning in the cerebellum, because the cerebellum is really important for controlling motor actions, is about controlling motor actions. Uh, neocortex is everything. I mean, so all of our higher level cognitive functions depend on the neocortex. And then the hippocampus is critical for episodic memory and therefore synaptic changes. Learning in the hippocampus is really important for memory. And we'll certainly see that in the next chapter about memory. Okay, so now we're going to talk about classical conditioning. This is learning that depends on brain systems involving uh, dopamine. And we'll talk about what those look like in a second. Uh, it includes the basal ganglia, but other brainstem nuclei as well. And these are really classic phenomena, classical conditioning, doesn't get any more classical than that. Uh, so you probably know these things already, but um, basically you have a uh, unconditioned stimulus, which is so named because it's something that automatically even without any learning experience, kind of has some uh, rewarding value, okay, or punishing value equally, either way. You have a response to that, uh, which may be, you know, various different responses, depending on what kind of stimulus it is, and that's known as the unconditioned response, or UCR. Then, uh, during the process of conditioning, the whole idea is that you're pairing some previously neutral stimulus, like this bell sound, with the uh, US and seeing to what extent that is learned. There's an association that's formed between the CS and that US. And so before conditioning, uh, you ring the bell, this is the initial test and there's no response. It's like, okay, whatever, that's a bell. Um, but then after uh, you do this learning process of pairing the bell with the uh, food, so in other words, pairing the CS with the US, you uh, train up this response, okay, do the natural kind of unconditioned response. Um, and really, it seems like you're in the brain learning the association between the CS and the US, not the response per se. The US association really drives the response. And then after conditioning, you can kind of ring the bell and the classic phenomenon is you see this kind of uh, conditioned response. And nowadays we look inside the brain and we see that this kind of association has been learned at different levels in different brain systems. So we now call it a conditioned response. It's the same response. It's just that now it's being elicited in a conditioned way as opposed to in an unconditioned way originally. There's a really funny example of this in the uh, TV series, The Office. Uh, so I recommend you click on this link and you'll be entertained by seeing that uh, real world demonstration of conditioned uh, learning. But the most interesting thing about 
uh, this conditioning these days is that we know that it depends on dopamine that involves this whole dopamine system. And everybody has this kind of naive, we think, uh, you know, as scientists, uh, understanding of what dopamine is and how it works. So this is your kind of classic presentation. Uh, dopamine just makes you feel happy. It's feel good hormone. It's not a hormone. It's a neuromodulator. Um, and you know, it's, this is just a little diagram here. It's released in your kind of midbrain ventral tegmental area it goes up to all different parts of the brain, including the basal ganglia, most especially, and then it also does influence up there in cortex. What we want to understand about dopamine, as we've said many times, is that it's not a feel good hormone. Okay. It is something that is very sensitive to expectations. It's governed by this very kind of critical expectation driven learning process that actually is driven by dopamine itself. And so dopamine signals the difference between what you expect and what you experience, not this kind of raw feeling of pleasure that you might have from receiving a reward. And so in fact, as you learn, dopamine gets reduced away, it gets explained away, it gets uh, kind of discounted by the expectation that you now have expected that reward and therefore no longer get it. So it's kind of a Grinch actually, <laughs> um, as compared to the kind of standard presentation of it, it being this kind of you know, uh, pure hedonic system. It turns out that that property of having that critic uh, having everything being that contrast effect that we've emphasized so much, the contrast relative to expectations is essential for learning because it allows dopamine to really be not a feel-good system, but a learning system. It's something that drives learning towards those things that we don't yet know or we don't yet expect. So let's look at the raw data here. Uh, this is the Wolfram Schultz's data. He did a lot of the original recordings in uh, the ventral tegmental area of a monkey doing classical conditioning tasks. So you have a CS, which is a tone, a US or a reward, which is a drop of juice. Here, initially, if you don't play the condition stimulus, no, no tone, um, and then you give this drop of juice, that's a kind of unexpected reward. And, and indeed, you do get this kind of burst of dopamine and the monkey was like, oh, good, dopamine <laughs> and juice. Um, but then here you, you see this critical result that if you do play the condition stimulus, and again, this is after learning has taken place. So uh, the monkey has already learned that when that tone goes off, they come to expect this uh, juice drop, you don't get any dopamine, okay? And that's the critical thing about dopamine. This is the critical critic part of dopamine, that it is relative to the fact that you now are expecting that juice drop. And so when it comes, you don't experience any dopamine burst relative to this kind of baseline level of firing of dopamine overall. And then even more, if you have that same kind of expectation triggered by the condition stimulus, and now you don't get any reward at all, that's even worse, right? You get this dip or pause in firing of the dopamine neurons. They go below, below this overall base rate of firing. And that we think is associated with a kind of disappointment kind of feeling. Um, and it's really important because it actually uh, is used, we think, as a learning signal to train the system to not expect these kinds of outcomes again in the future in various brain systems. So one really important point about this is that when you get this juice drop, you still experience the juice drop. You still experience the kind of feeling of, you know, pleasure associated with having that juice. Um, it maybe isn't as kind of like extra sparkly uh, as you might have experienced when, you know, it was unexpected. But there's a lot more to the experience than just this kind of dopamine element. And so, you know, the dopamine does have these kind of positive uh, feel good kind of associations presumably, but it's really, it, it, when we experience it, it's much more about what we don't expect. It's not about what we expect, and yet we still get lots of ex uh, pleasure from things that we do expect. And so you have to really dissociate that kind of pleasure, the hedonic value from the dopamine itself. The dopamine is not equivalent to the hedonic value of the stimulus.
it's really better to think about it as this contrast driven critic driven kind of learning signal that says what do i know what do i not know and what am i surprised and you know if you think about it uh, more broadly you're kind of surprised when this condition stimulus goes off here because you didn't expect it at that time you didn't know when that condition stimulus might come on and so you get dopamine then but uh, if you know we, there are there are other experiments which show that if you have like another condition stimulus that predicts that condition stimulus, you don't get the 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 dopamine for the second condition stimulus. So basically, it's really much more of like a surprise signal and a learning signal than a feel good signal. If we go back to thinking about this kind of predictive learning, it fits very uh, well with this idea that dopamine is actually also signaling a prediction error. Okay, and it's a prediction error. Uh, relative to your expectation of reward. Um, and so that's also important. We think like the cortex is learning about prediction errors with respect to all sorts of other things, whereas dopamine is specifically learning about prediction errors with respect to kind of meaningful, valuable outcomes, which we you know describe generally speaking as reward. Well, why don't you just fool yourself into having low expectations and then you'll always be happy, right? And there's two things wrong with that. First of all, uh, again, the dopamine aspect of the experience is not the whole experience. And so, you know, having those low expectations uh, that isn't necessary to experience things as positive. Um, but also, you have to appreciate that this learning rule, this learning mechanism of having things relative to expectations keeps your learning in the zone, right? Uh, and so it keeps you kind of uh, right there in that kind of craving state of like, I know I know all this other stuff. Here's the stuff I don't know. And that's going to be, you know, where you're going to get the most value out of your new learning. And so really dopamine is, is driving and focusing your learning on the things that you don't know so that you can then learn them. And then once you learn them, you then move on to the next thing. So essentially learning is a greedy process, right? So it's it's this fundamental greed that's, that's underlying all of our behavior that everything that we already expect, we kind of discount. Once we expect it, we know it, we anticipate it. It doesn't have that kind of novelty uh, signal. And so we really wanna uh, focus on those things that are new, that have that contrast uh, from our expectations. Um, but you can do certain tricks, you know, so you can you can basically decide how much information uh, you might want to get about like a movie. If you're going to go see a movie or these days sit on your couch and watch a movie, um, you may not want to, you know, find out too much information about it in advance so that you can experience it kind of without those expectations. And going back to, you know, the, the key ideas from uh, Buddhist philosophy you know, these expectations are in some ways like the attachments. Um, and and if we if we kind of are always living within our expectations, kind of feeling the weight of those expectations, um, then everything is kind of experienced relative to those expectations. And so there is a sense that, you know, you may want to escape that kind of uh, power of those expectations in certain ways. You know, it definitely is uh, a really important and powerful way of thinking about uh, behavior and relationships and everything uh, to, to understand how our experience is shaped relative to these expectations. But uh, I think the key point computationally, functionally, biologically, is that you have to have this system relative to expectations so that the, the organism keeps progressing, keeps advancing. Otherwise, you just kind of are very content with whatever you're at right now. And so in some ways, dopamine is very ambition driving kind of system, uh, preventing you from just being satisfied with your current state. So along those lines, uh, there's very important implications. This phenomenon called partial reinforcement really taps into this feature of the dopamine system. So if you sometimes get a reward, but actually most of the time you don't, then your expectation is, well, I'm probably not going to get a reward, but sometimes you do, you know, really engages the dopamine when that thing finally happens. Now, of course, if it's so partial that you never really experience it, like winning the lottery, then maybe, you know, you don't. But of course, what happens with the lottery is you see all these people on TV. So you get that kind of vicarious experience and think, oh, that could be me.